Thank you, Seth, and good morning. That was a good verse that Seth just read for our text, which is Joshua chapter 7. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. It's rather lengthy. I'm going to read the first half and then the, the final verses, beginning with verse 24. But to set a little context, you remember from last week, from chapter 6, that Israel has conquered Jericho. It's the first city in Canaan that was conquered. And so a special city because it's the first of the conquests the Lord had a requirement for the nation. And that is that all of the spoils of war were to be given to the Lord and put in his treasury. All of the spoils of all of the other conquests were for the nation for the people, but at Jericho, they were for the Lord. And he made the point back in chapter 6 and verse 18 that should they take the spoils of war for themselves, the nation would be accursed. Well, as we read through and studied through the passage of chapter 6, all went well just as the Lord had prescribed. And the chapter ends, so the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all the land. Then chapter 7 begins, But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, sometimes that's pronounced A-I, I think the correct pronunciation according to my Hebrew professor is Ai, which is near Beit Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or three thousand men need go up to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there, for they are few. So about three thousand men from the people went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. So the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, both he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their back before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it, and they will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, Rise up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they have even taken some of the things under the ban, and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have put them among their own things. Therefore the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you any more unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Rise up. Consecrate the people and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, has said, There are things under the ban in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things under the ban 
from your midst. And this is what Joshua did. And through a procedure of casting lots, Achan was discovered. He confessed his sin and justice was carried out. Verse 24. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. They raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. One of the best known lines in English literature was written by John Donne. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent poem is actually about death and ends with another famous line about a funeral bell. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. But what the poet was saying is, none of us is an individual only. Separate, an island, self-sufficient, we are all connected in some way. What affects one affects another, affects all. That's actually a biblical principle. The church is a body. Paul describes us as the body of Christ. If one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. Now that was true of Israel as well. One sin could affect the whole nation. That's the story of Joshua chapter 7. How the secret sin of one man rippled through the nation with tragic consequences so that the bell tolled for him. It's a lesson on the seriousness of sin. In Joshua 6 verse 18, before Israel attacked Jericho, the Lord gave strict instructions that the people were to keep themselves from the spoils of victory. Otherwise, the nation would be accursed. Everything in Jericho was the Lord's and for His treasury. All went well. They conquered Jericho, burned the city, and verse 24 says, only the silver and gold, the articles of bronze and iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Then chapter 7 begins with an ominous statement. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. One man's sin affected God's relationship to the sons of Israel. That sets the stage and explains what follows when the nation moves to the next city on the path of conquest, I, located in the central hills of Canaan, about 13 miles northwest of Jericho. It was a smart strategy. Victory would give Israel control of the hill country and would divide the land north and south in their effort to conquer it. So Joshua sent men to go up and spy out the land. 
they returned with a very good report. They told Joshua, do not tell all the people to go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need go up. It's not necessary. It has very few people. The nation was riding high. It had defeated the Amorite kings, Sion and Og. They'd conquered the east side of the Jordan. Then Jericho, the walled city, had fallen to them. They were unstoppable, rolling up victories. I was nothing, just a, a small town they would roll over on their blitzkrieg through Canaan. They were confident. And why wouldn't they be? Verse 4, so about 3,000 men from the people went up there, but they fled from before the men of Ai. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. So their hearts, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Now they resemble the Canaanites who were so fearful of this army of Israel. What happened? The nation was devastated. Was it a problem of pride? No, well, we know from the scriptures, for example, Proverbs 16, verse 18, that pride goes before a fall. Pride's always a problem. But that's not the problem given here. And Joshua didn't suspect it was. He couldn't explain what had happened and was shaken to the core. The, the people had trusted the Lord. All that he had said, they'd gone out in faith and victory had occurred easily. Now suddenly, unexpectedly, defeat. And defeat at the hands of a small, insignificant town. A lesson that has been suggested from this is don't underestimate the enemy. And that's always good advice. But that's not the lesson here. It wouldn't have mattered if they had gone into those hills respecting the, the army of Ai and, and gone out in complete humility. In fact, if they had gone out with 10,000 more troops, it was a different problem. It was a problem of undetected sin. Confused, humiliated, in deep sorrow, Joshua and the elders of Israel tore their clothes. They threw dust on their heads in genuine contrition over the, uh, the setback that the nation had experienced, this humiliating defeat. And then Joshua fell on his face before the ark of the Lord, and he put his feelings into words with a, a prayer that bordered on despair. Verse 7, Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their back before their enemies, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it, and they will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? Now Joshua prayed with passion, but without understanding. Israel had gone to battle, assuming victory was assured, that was the promise. So what had become of the promise of God? Joshua's despair sounded like Israel's complaint against Moses when they said that God had brought them out into the wilderness to destroy them. They should have stayed in Egypt. In fact, they wanted to go back. But Joshua wasn't grumbling. His concern was not only for Israel and its conquest, his concern was also for the Lord's reputation, His glory. What will you do for your great name, he wondered. This was not a prayer of unbelief. 
It was a prayer of confusion. And it's far better to go to the Lord with our confusion, even our self-pity, than turn away from prayer altogether. That is unbelief. Prayer is an act of faith, and Joshua was a man of faith. And like many men and women of faith who are confused by the circumstances of life, he wrestled with God in prayer. But as Joshua would discover, the problem was not with the ways of the Lord, but with Joshua's lack of understanding. It's always that way. There are examples of that in the Bible, and one of my favorite examples of that is Jacob. And it's a favor because it's like so many of us. In Genesis 42, during the great famine, when his sons returned from Egypt, Jacob was told that Simeon, his son, had been held back in Egypt, and the, the ruler there, the man, the prime minister, demanded that the brothers bring back their youngest, Benjamin, if they wanted more grain and if they wanted to see their brother Simeon again. Benjamin was his youngest child, Jacob's prized son, his, his last living link to his beloved Rachel. And he feared losing him to this man in Egypt. So he cried out, all these things are against me. It was the opposite. All those things were for him. Simeon was alive. Joseph, his most loved son, was not only alive, he was the man. He was the prime minister who was calling them down to Egypt and to safety. No, all those things were for them. Elijah experienced despair. Jezebel had chased him into the desert, and in exhaustion, he prayed, It is enough now, Lord. Oh, take my life. Now, you think about that. That was a completely irrational prayer. He wanted the Lord to take his life because wicked Queen Jezebel threatened to take his life. Irrational, but typical. Later, he declared to the Lord, I alone am left. I'm the only faithful one in Israel. I'm an island. He was not. As the Lord told him, there were still 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. The reason for the, these troubles among the saints was not the Lord's failure. It was a lack of understanding and a lack of faith on their part. But even though he, he was confused and lacked a correct understanding, still, Joshua had gone to the Lord with his concerns. And because he had, because he'd gone to the Lord in prayer, the Lord answered him. His answer was abrupt, but gave correction. Verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, Rise up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they have even taken some of the things under the ban and have stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have put them among their own things. That was not only an answer to the problem, it was not only an explanation for why defeat occurred in spite of the great promise of victory that the Lord had given. But this was not, not only that, it was a rebuke to Joshua, not for his prayer, but for his failure to detect, to detect sin as the reason for the defeat. Joshua, who had seen the consequences of sin in Israel in the previous 40 years, should have detected the symptoms of the disease that was in the camp, this spiritual problem. But what we see here, and in verse 1, is Israel has sinned. That's what the Lord says. Israel has sinned, when in fact only Achan had sinned. 
So what are we to make of that? Some have referred to this as corporate solidarity. And what they mean by that is this is a case of one person, Achan, being seen as a representative of the whole group of all Israel. And there are other examples of that. The Lord spoke of the nation Israel as his son. He did that early in the book of Exodus when he promised that he would bring them out of Egypt from their slavery. And then much later in the book of Hosea in chapter 11, verse 1, the Lord said, when Israel was a youth, I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son. He looked at the nation as an individual. So the nation is seen that way. And here, an individual is seen as the nation. What we can say is, while people are individually responsible for their actions, they're still united in a community or society. So what we do affects others. God called Israel His Son. The church is called Christ's body. We are connected, and the things we do individually affect one another. Here, Achan's sin affected the whole nation so that the nation shared in his guilt. When there is sin in the church, it affects the entire church. Just as when we have a virus in our body, it affects the whole body. Now, the Hebrew word for sin is an interesting word. It's a word that, in a sense, defines itself. In the book of Judges, chapter 20 and verse 16, this word for sin is used in a military context. It's not used in a moral sense, but the way it's used gives us a sense of the meaning of sin. It's used of warriors of the tribe of Benjamin. They were left-handed men who could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. The word miss is the word for sin. Sin is missing the mark. And these warriors didn't miss the mark. They were so accurate they could hit a hair at a great distance. The target for us is never that narrow or difficult. And it, 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 it's always broad and obvious. And it was for Achan. There's no mistaking the target. Don't take anything from Jericho. Anything. Keep yourselves from the things under the ban. But Achan couldn't do it. It was just too tempting. Now we might be inclined to go easy on Achan, recognizing how inviting all of that was. How inviting and tempting the glitter of gold and silver are but the Lord does not go easy on him. There are no small sins to God. It is all serious. And the seriousness of the sin and the Lord's anger over it is indicated in verse 11, where he used six words, six verbs to describe what Achan did. They build progressively to the end. They include Achan, but then they, they include the whole nation. He sinned, he transgressed, and then it's the nation. He says, they have taken the stuff, stolen, deceived, put it, meaning hidden it. Achan did it, but it's ascribed to the nation. Israel has sinned. And so the Lord told Joshua to get up. Get up and fix the problem. Why are you here before the ark, Joshua, when you should be out in the camp dealing with the sin? Rise up. And to show how serious all of this was, the Lord gives the consequences of it in verse 12. There would be no blessing from the Lord until the sin was dealt with and all of the treasures that had been stolen were removed from the camp. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. What a change that is from chapter 1 and, and the statement, I will be with you, I will not fail you or forsake you. It's the same with us. We cannot expect the Lord's blessing on ourselves individually. We cannot expect the Lord's blessings on the church 
if we're living in disobedience. I heard a sermon not long ago in which a preacher, a man that I know, spoke of a minister in his community who had just left a church that was thriving. It had about 500 members. Ten years earlier, he had been sent to that church to bury it. It was dying. When he arrived, it had about 20 members. But he discovered that there were two families among that small group that were feuding. So he talked to them. They agreed to meet. The division was cleared up. And the church was blessed and it began to grow. God requires of His people unity and love and unity not only in love for one another, but unity in doctrine. That's what He blesses. Sin has consequences for us personally and as a church and as a nation. It results in loss of power, loss of influence, loss of joy and growth. It results in defeat. Did for Israel. And so, in the next verses, the Lord directs Joshua in the process that would expose the guilty person. First, the people were to be consecrated, set apart, and dedicated to the task. And then next, they were to draw lots. Verse 14, In the morning, then, you shall come near by your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes by lot shall come near by families, and the families which the Lord takes shall come near by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And so through the process of drawing lots, the guilty person would be found. And then thirdly, he was to be executed. So consecrate yourselves. Secondly, cast lots. Thirdly, carry out justice. It was a lengthy process that through the process and the length of it would have impressed on the people the seriousness of the moment and the violation. But also it gave the guilty man time to repent. So we read in verse 16, Joshua rose early in the morning and he brought Israel near by tribes. At this point, Achan may have felt safe, hidden among the thousands of the twelve tribes. But then we read that the tribe of Judah was taken. Now the noose begins to tighten, and you can just imagine that Achan's heart rate went up. So Joshua brought the tribe of Judah near, and he took the family of the Zerahites. Then Joshua brought them near. Now the circle was very small, but Achan was silent, thinking he might still escape. If that was his thinking, if that was his hope, it was, it was foolish and proved to be because we read in verse 18, Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, was taken. All through this process, we read, was taken. Taken by Lot, probably, but more to the point, taken by God. Captured. Moses warned Israel, be sure your sin will find you out. God sees all and knows all. The eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. Proverbs 15.3 What we do in secret, we do openly before the Lord. He can see things, He knows things, He's omniscient, He knows everything. And through a strange providence or through a process like this, He can make it known. Now with Achan's sin exposed, Joshua encouraged him to confess. Verse 19, then Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, 
and give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. The idea of this confession is it's a way of honoring God. He knows everything. But in confessing what we know he knows, we're honoring him. Well, Joshua's words give a sense of real concern and compassion. They seem genuine. They are genuine. He has compassion on this man. And Achan, maybe moved by that, didn't deny the crime. And how could he? He'd been found out. He came clean and explained everything. Verse 20, So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. And this is what I did. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful mantle from Shinar, and 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. Man, that's impressive, isn't it? You look at that and you say, yeah, that's a a nice collection of stuff. He says, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. When I saw, he said, as I thought about that, I thought about, I thought about the eye and what an amazing gift of God it is. Jesus called the eye the lamp of the body. As a lamp shines light into a dark room, the eye transmits information of the world to the mind. A more Clinical description of the human eye is 127 million cells called rods and cones lined up in rows as the seeing elements that receive light and transmit a message to the brain. Well, David didn't know all of that, but he knew enough to say of the body In Psalm 139, verse 14, in all of its complex parts, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And that is so true. But man, fallen man, always turns God's wonders into a curse. So that the same eye that gives us a window on the world and a glimpse of the beauty of God's creation is made an instrument of sin for our soul. John wrote of it, 1 John 2.16, of the lust of the eyes. Joshua 7 gives an example of that and its consequences, which had already cost Israel 36 men. When I saw recalls Genesis 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was, was a delight to the eyes, she took and ate and gave also to her husband. There it is from the beginning. The lust of the eyes. Through that great blessing of the eye, sin entered Adam And through Adam, it entered the whole human race. We have all been infected by his sin. And because we are a piece of the continent, all part of a single race, Adam's race, now, as John Donne wrote, the bell tolls, it tolls for thee, for every one of us. Now it would toll for Achan. Following his confession, Joshua sent two men to verify his account and to retrieve the treasures. They brought them back and poured them out before the Lord, probably there at the tabernacle. Then, with the trial complete and Achan's guilt established, his sentence was pronounced and carried out. Verse 24, Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. 
And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Does that seem harsh? Admittedly, it does to many. Too harsh. Uh, We're inclined to give Achan a pass on this since we realize how easily we could fall into the same sin of coveting and do. You might have even sensed that as you read these treasures that he had seen and that he and that he coveted. Uh, Nevertheless, Achan was guilty. He confessed his guilt. Truly, I have sinned against the Lord. And all of Scripture teaches what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. The wages of sin is death. And God chose to demonstrate that by enforcing justice rather than showing mercy. Because it was necessary to teach Israel the seriousness and the widespread effects of sin. But still, why his family? Maybe we wonder they had some involvement in this. We don't know, but you think about it. They may have been accomplices. After all, he buried the treasures in his tent. Seems unlikely that it would have been a secret to them. Now, that's one explanation that's been given for including the entire family and all of his possessions in this penalty. Uh, We can wonder about these things without second-guessing God or questioning His justice. Abraham asked, Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? It's a rhetorical question, and the answer to that is yes. He will always deal justly. And that's where we begin in our understanding of such things. But again, there is a purpose to all of this. It's for us as much as it was for Israel. And it is to show us how serious sin is and how it affects others. How the things that we do have wide-ranging consequences. And so to make that a lasting lesson for the nation, the the stones they piled up over Achan and his family were left as Monuments to the event and, and a reminder to them of the consequences of sin. Verse 26 ends, Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. Achor is a play on the name Achan. It's a pun. It means trouble. Because Achan brought Achor on Israel... The Lord brought Achor on Achan. That's the idea. Remember the trouble that comes with sin. And so Israel had another stone monument like the one at Gilgal, but this one was to remind the people of the consequences of sin. Nothing is hidden from the Lord. Psalm 139, darkness and light are alike to you. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth. Our eyes move to and fro as well. And that is often the problem. The lust of the eyes. The problem, though, is not with the eye. It's with the heart. The mind and will that acts upon the information transmitted to it. And James gives a a development of that, the development of sin and its consequences in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. It's a kind of anatomy of sin, tracing the development of sin. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. In other words, sin kills It may kill physically or spiritually, but the result of sin is it always has destructive consequences on a person's life, as we have seen here, and among the people of God. We are not islands. We are all a piece of the continent. Christians are members in the body of Christ. 
That's what the church is. And as Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14, the body is not one member, but many. Each member is dependent on the others. We are a whole. When one part is sick, the whole body is sick. But also, when we are healthy, we are a blessing to the rest. That's Paul's point. If one member suffers, he says, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. Now, that should be our goal. We are joined together intimately in a body. It should be our goal to make the members of that body rejoice, to make the body healthy and whole and useful. In Romans chapter 6, verse 11, Paul gives the first command in the book. He's developed doctrine in the first six, six or five and a half chapters and uh, in the development of the doctrines that prominent, the prominent doctrine that stands out the, the main theme of those chapters is the doctrine of justification by faith alone we through faith in Christ are made right with God forgiven and righteous in his sight but also, we are new creatures in Christ. The power of sin in us has been broken. So Paul says, reckon that to be true. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. He develops that in the next two verses, um, in verses uh, 12 and 13. Therefore... Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now that word instruments is also the Greek word for weapons. Don't use the members of your body, your eye, your ears, your hands, your feet as weapons of unrighteousness, but of righteousness. Be careful what you look at and where you go. We need to understand who we are and live according to it. We are new creatures with new abil abilities, members of one body, the church, we are joined together in Christ. We have the life of Christ in us. We have the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, in us. We have ability to live a supernatural life. As we do that, we bless the church and we make it rejoice. That's to God's glory, as well as to our benefit and the benefit of others. A witness to the world. We have time to do that. We have opportunity to do that. God has given us that, but the time and the opportunity is short. We're mortal. The bell tolls. It tolls for thee. It tolls for all. That's serious. If you're here without Christ, it's very serious. If you have not recognized that you are Achan, that you are a sinner under the sentence of death right now, realize it because it is true. It's what the scriptures teach. The sentence has been passed on the whole human race. Escape the punishment, which is physical and spiritual, which is temporal and eternal. Escape by coming to Christ who died in the place of sinners. All who believe in him trust in His sacrifice alone for salvation, are saved. Their sins are paid for in full at the cross. They are forgiven. They are given eternal life. Give glory to God by confessing your sin and your need of the Savior and trust in Him. He receives all who do. May God help you to do that and help all of us to be careful in our life and our walk and seek to honor Him through our obedience. <clears throat> it will be a blessing.
to each other, to the church, and to the world. Let's close in a word of prayer, and in doing that, let's give thanks for the supper that we are about to enjoy. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your Word, what we have considered. Difficult passage, Father. But one that um, reminds us of the seriousness of sin, not only to ourselves, but to others. But we're, we, Father, also know that Your grace is great, and You cover a multitude of sins through the sacrifice of Your Son. We thank You for the Lord Jesus Christ. Left to ourselves, we would all be aching, and we would be destroyed but through Him, because He took the punishment in our place, we have life and have life everlasting. We thank You for that. And we thank You for this Lord's Supper that we're about to enjoy and partake of, because it reminds us of what He did for us and what we have as a result of His sacrifice for us. Bless us now as we turn to that, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Before we take the Lord's Supper, let's stand and prepare our hearts by singing number 40, Arise My Soul. Reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. As we move into our observance of the Lord's Supper, I'd like to draw your attention to just the one idea out of that passage of hope. It's found at the end of verse 8, the hope of salvation. Uh, Christian hope is by definition uh, different, different than the world's conception of hope, which more commonly represents something like a sincere wish whereas Christian hope is the certainty of a future outcome. And in the context of Paul's message here, uh, the content of this hope is what is represented in the elements of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the bread representing the body of Christ given over in death for his people. The wine uh, representing his blood. So it's obviously the language of sacrifice. This is my body given for you. Uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed or poured out for the forgiveness of many. Uh, here is no empty sacrifice, no foolish s sacrifice, certainly no cheap sacrifice, but a, a sacrifice of the greatest value, or as we say, of infinite value, uh, so valuable that by it, uh, Jesus Christ purchased for us a perfect and sure hope. The content of the hope, the apostle tells us in these verses, is salvation, uh, defined in verse 10 in a way that has meaning for all who belong to him by faith, especially perhaps today in the light of loved ones who have recently uh, departed from us, that whether we are awake, Paul says, as we all are here now, or asleep, as we all, uh, unless Jesus comes before, will one day be. We will live together with him. That's Christian hope, and it's expressed, as I said, in, in these elements. And as we partake of them now, uh, we are to be encouraged 
as the 11th verse of our passage <laughs> indicates. We're, we're to be encouraged, which is just what we're doing, uh, Sunday by Sunday, as we build up one another in hope. And so if you're present with us today, and you can say that I have believed that Christ Jesus offered his body and his blood uh, for me in my place, and because of that I ha have the hope of salvation, then we want you to participate with us now in the Lord's Supper. Let me give thanks for the bread. Father, thank you for this bread, such a simple um, thing, uh, a, a, a simple uh, element that is important only uh, for what it stands for. Uh, it stands for uh, the incarnation of very God of very God, the Son of God who came and took upon himself human flesh, lived without sin, and gave himself uh, for us so that we might live and have hope. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read a verse from Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation 7, John has a vision of heaven. And in it he sees two groups. There are two groups that will appear in the future. The first group is 144,000 servants of the Lord from the tribes of Israel. The second is a great multitude of Gentiles from every nation, too many to count. They wore white robes, they carried uh, palm branches, they cried out in a loud voice, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. One of the heavenly persons, one of the elders who were with John asked John, uh, who are these who are clothed in white? In verse 14 we read, I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Very interesting statement. Blood that makes white. That is a unique washing and a completely sufficient one as well. A bath in the blood of the Lamb, which is the sacrificial death of Christ that has unique cleansing power. It removes our uncleanness, all our sin and guilt. The word washed is a simple past tense in the Greek text, and it refers to an action that took place in a moment. So it speaks of faith. It wasn't a process of cleansing. At the moment of faith in Christ, in His person and His sacrifice, they were cleansed by the blood, clothed in white robes, meaning justified, fully forgiven, and accepted by God forever. That's true of every believer in Jesus Christ. You are clothed in white. In the righteousness of Christ, you possess that. And you possess His victory over sin and death and have the hope to come, the hope of heaven, the hope of the kingdom to come, the hope of all eternity. He did that for us. He did that for every believer in Him. Let's remember that as we give thanks for the cup, which speaks of His sacrifice that cleanses us from sin and guilt. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for that. That blood that doesn't stain, but washes sin away, removes the stain of sin, and then replaces it with the righteousness of Christ. <clears throat> we thank You for that. Help us to remember that and appreciate that as we take the cup that speaks of His death for us. In Christ's name, amen. Let's close with a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you 
and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. It's good to see all of you here this morning. As you run the race of faith this week, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, and by God's grace, we'll see you again next week.